Okay, let's uh, let's get the show on the road. Um, Emily, are you able to? Yes, when your camera on. So welcome everybody to this webinar. We're going to talk about how to get PFAS treated in soils. And those soils could be in situ soils or they could be already excavated and stockpiled somewhere. Um, or they could be soils that are coming from even from soil washings and fines are, are left over that, that are not clean. Um, essentially, we have come up with a way to thermally treat this PFAS impacted waste in a safe manner. And we'll be talking about um, our first field demonstration on that today. And with me, I have Patrick Joyce, who was the project manager for, for a project in Alaska and Emily Crownover, who is our lead scientist and also ma managing principal engineer who did a lot of the design and modeling work um, and oversaw the project. Um, before we get going, remember there is a Q&A uh, tab you can choose. And you, if you have any comments, um, good ones, hopefully, or questions, type them in at any time. We'll try to read them as, as we go through this. And if we don't um, incorporate your questions into it during the first 30 minutes, we have 15 additional minutes at the end where we'll try to go through the questions. Should we miss one or skip one, we intend to do written re replies to the questions that, that we miss after the webinar. Um, so welcome again. And um, I think I'll start with a quick little, um, little start also that PFAS now, the EPA is uh, putting PFOA and PFOS on the, on the CERCLA NPL list, right? They're gonna be listed as hazardous um, contaminants. So it makes this type of treatment even more relevant where um, before when there weren't really that many regulations on PFAS, there is going to be now. So in the future, what to do with, with PFAS laden cells is gonna change from what, where it was, where you could landfill it. Um, now that is much less certain. So on-site solutions where you're not transporting it, on-site solutions where you're getting the PFAS out of the soil and, and treating it either to a minimum amount of waste or destroying it on-site are going to be more attractive to basically the government and private um, customers. So with that, Patrick, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you, you know, the, the project we did at Eielson Air Force Base, we, we treated a pile of dirt up there. Would you mind uh, walking us through a few of the, the steps in, in getting ready for that, please? Certainly, certainly. Um, so if you would go to uh, the first slide with some photos that I sent your way. Yes. Uh, so we were presented with a pile here out, out at Isleson Air Force Base, um, covered up. It was it was contained soil pile. It was in a previously excavated uh, soil that was just uh, contained and, and waiting for treatment uh, or disposal. So this was uh, what we walked up to. Uh, step one was really to to peel back those layers and get it ready for drilling uh, to install our thermal treatment system in this pile. We, we actually didn't have to modify this pile in any way. Uh, we, we could have chosen to had we had we decided to do that, but we were basically able to leave the pile right as it sat, uh, peel back that layer and install our heater casings right, right down into the soil. Uh, we did that with a, a geoprobe rig, got right up on the pile, uh, drove a hole and then inserted a casing that would later contain uh, our heater. Um, the next photo, shows uh, sort of the intermediate uh, construction. Um, what you see here, all those, all those metal pipes sticking out of the ground, those are the heater casings. So the, the heater will be inserted in, inside that casing. Uh, the stainless steel one coming up on the side there, um, on the left, there were four or five of those. Those were the vapor extraction points. So as we heat that pile, we'll be uh, applying a vacuum to it that will uh, extract the PFAS vapors. Uh, we also needed to seal it off. We don't want any moisture uh, going in. We don't want moisture coming out. We want to seal those vapors up. Uh, so there was a uh, silicone barrier that was installed over the top. That's what that red you see is. And then each casing had a, had a, a cement collar around it as well to, to really seal that off. Um, In terms of scale, yeah. how, how tall was it? Um, uh, the pile was about four feet tall uh, at its deepest location. 
Um, I want to say about 30 by 30 feet, uh, something like that, maybe a little bigger, 40, 50 feet um, at its longest edge. It wasn't exactly a perfect square. Um, the other thing, in order to, to prep the pile, we did have dimensions. Um, we got up there and, and marked out those locations. So all those all those heaters were, uh, were uh, measured out and marked with the appropriate spacing, uh, which is part of the design. And we have some that are that are quite crooked. Um, I guess yeah. that on purpose, right? It wasn't because yeah, of, yeah. The crooked ones, it's uh, those are actually angled, and so we can angle. And we did that on the side of the pile there uh, to improve that surface area um, and make sure that we were heating that that bottom part there uh, of the pile as well. So that's something that's typical in 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 situ installations as well when we can go under buildings and that sort of thing. So uh, an angled heater was was uh, right up our alley. All right. Cool. And then on the next one, um, this is where we have the insulation. So uh, heat loss is obviously uh, something we want to fight and uh, insulate that pile as best we can. So we use rock wool. Um, I believe it came out to be about eight inches of rock wool uh, on top. Um, then the biggest part of that, the biggest challenge there was to keep it dry. Um, so we've insulated that whole pile. The picture on the on the right uh, shows the final product. This is this is what the pile looked like. Um, you can see those white boxes on top of the casings. Those are the junction boxes that's controlling the electrical power going to each individual heater that's down the casing. There's the horizontal stainless steel piping there. That's the vapor extraction line. Um, so those are networked uh, around the pile and those run to our treatment uh, system. And then uh, those boards were for us to walk around on. So we weren't, we weren't depressing the insulation. Um, but most importantly, uh, we, we fabricated a, a cover uh, ultimately to to make sure that we kept this pile dry. Um, if the rock wool got wet, it was going to really reduce its insulation value. Um, and so, you know, once, uh, once we're up and running, it was uh, safe to walk around up there, uh, make modifications as needed, collect data. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's what it looked like. All right. Um, and then I think this is the last one I sent you. We have just our, our equipment treatment compound. Um, so on the right, it's uh, still summertime there. We got all our equipment mobilized. We have uh, uh, a whole system that we'll, we'll talk through in a second. We had water tanks uh, to store wastewater. We had a makeup water tank to store our, our potable water makeup, um, a circulation tank for the scrubber, and as well as all the, all the vapor and liquid treatment systems. Um, that was all mobilized uh, via truck. Um, it all came from our warehouse in Indianapolis, uh, about 3,000 miles traveled. Uh, on, the, on the way there, we actually went direct with a truck through Canada. On the way back, everything traveled on a ship. Um, the tanks were um, mobilized from, uh, from the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska. Um, but then ultimately, the photo on the left, we had to uh, cover ourselves in a tent, uh, scheduling delays, um, procurement delays this was this was coming right off the the tails of of covid lockdowns and and all that so we did struggle with uh with supply chain limitations um and ultimately found ourselves operating in the winter time um which i think we'll get to in a minute but ultimately we covered our entire treatment compound with the tent on the left which was uh which was a good move <laughs> so that that leads me to the next question um so we had we 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 had this pile right. Um, we we heated the subsurface temperature up near four hundred degrees Celsius. And and Emily, I, I assume what then happens based on some of the research we we did in the past is that a lot of the PFAS becomes a vapor, becomes a gas, right? And Patrick said we had nine soil vapor extraction screens. So we we're pulling a vacuum on this pile, and then then. What did did we choose to do with those vapors? You know, did we destroy them, or did we? What did we do with them? Yeah, yeah. So, in in terms of how we handled the vapors, as you mentioned, we had soil vapor extraction screens um, across the pile, and as we were applying a vacuum to that, we're pulling those vapors out of the stockpile and then sending them on. Um, if you wanted to go to a process flow diagram, that'd be, that'd be awesome. And we're essentially sending those vapors onto initially a scrubber and then onto a, a condenser and cooling tower. Our intent here is to cool those vapors and then condense any moisture that's present in, in the vapor stream. And then we'll essentially have two different uh, process streams, a, a vapor and a liquid 
liquid stream that were then sent on to granular activated carbon for treatment. Um, you mentioned destruction. We are definitely um, continuing to look at that closely. You know, there might be some scenarios where it could be an option where we're looking to destroy the PFAS that we volatilized from the stockpile. Um, but there are some challenges associated with that. Um, this is a much more energy efficient approach. Um, and there's also in terms of potential uh, byproducts that might be generated in that destruction process if we were to go that route. And that's just something we're looking at closely. And there's a lot of folks out there that are that are looking at this as well. So something we're continuing to look at, but right now, um, you know, using this cooling condensation and then adsorption onto uh, carbon is really, you know, we see that as a very sustainable option. And then if, you know, at the uh, later on, there are a number of destruction technologies that are emerging right now that might be able to destroy um, PFAS that's uh, adsorbed to carbon. So that would even, you know, we're, we're really reducing the amount of PFAS impacted waste that's generated by concentrating it onto a small amount of carbon. Um, and there's some emerging technologies that you know could potentially even use to be used to um, destroy the the PFAS absorbed onto the carbon. And that's that actually goes both for the vapor phase carbon down or liquid phase carbon down here, right? And, exactly. and the vapor phase carbon. Um, yep. Yeah, they can get it can get fluidized and and sent through something like uh, supercritical water oxidation. Um, things under really high pressure and temperature, the PFAS may get, get destroyed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we're speaking about one um, ESTCP project right now, but we're actually, we're actively doing another one where we're sending um, process water. Um, and some of those samples are being sent on to Timothy Strathman's lab um, with Colorado School of Mines. And we're looking at that, at that process and its ability to, this is the subcritical water oxidation to treat. Yeah. That that could be, yeah that could be even more powerful because then you don't even need the the the, the GAC down here right you could do mm -hmm. critical water oxidation directly on the on the condensate exactly so we're looking at a lot of different options of how we might be able to combine technologies with thermal desorption to try mm -hmm. to minimize the amount of PFAS impacted waste that's generated yeah just if I may also a few other things we we're, we're looking at is the carbon that's spent. You know, typically is a is a hazardous waste and it has to go somewhere. But it's actually really good feedstock for for guys like Sevron who do smoldering. We could give them spent GAC. You know, if it's allowed to, to if, or if they're on the same site, they actually can use it as a fuel source for their smoldering. They mix in coal or other other basically BTU holding material with the soil, so it will smolder and this is perfect for that so we're, we're definitely open to basically have almost no waste generated from this right um that's a, that's one of the sustainability uh, targets we have and i just want to repeat one thing emily said we're not doing thermal oxidation we're doing cooling and scrubbing <clears throat> one of the main reasons is if we were to have a thermal oxidizer here we would burn a whole lot of gas fossil fuel that we'll never get back. It's not very sustainable. And we have to deal with, like she said, the you said the um, the potential byproducts, um, even fluorinated dioxin compounds. You know, we, we all have heard of chlorinated dioxin compounds, but fluorinated dioxin compounds may be discovered to be even worse. So that whole thing, that whole can of worms you open if you're burning the vapors, it's actually nice to not go that route. Uh, Others will will probably solve that that challenge and and but but this to us feels safer. Cool it off, and then you're handling it under uh, ambient temperature conditions. Definitely, and and as part of IELTSIM, we were able to perform OTM forty five sampling at that first sample port on the left at the extracted vapors, and now um, at, in our next demonstration that was ESTCP funded. <laughs> Um, they're also um, funding OTM45 sampling, not only at that sample port, but also before and after carbon treatment on that far right-hand side. So we're getting more data with these demonstrations. And as Gore mentioned, we're, you know, we're continuing to want to look at you know, what's the most um, energy efficient and, and effective approach. Awesome. So there's, there's the system, and it's now snowed, Patrick. <laughs> so I, I was going to ask you, if you don't mind, you know, walk us through the the operations how how did it actually go please certainly yeah so as i mentioned earlier we got a little bit of a later start than we than we wanted to um but trs is is equipped and prepared to operate in winter conditions um i think this is some of the most extreme conditions we've we've ever operated a site 
Um, you can see the, the layout there. We have a, the, the PCU is right in the front there. That's the power control unit. That's what's actually controlling the electrical energy going to all the heaters. Um, on the left there, we have a cooling tower that's used in the, in the cooling system that, that Emily described. Uh, I thought it was funny. At, at some point, we actually turned off the fan. Uh, we didn't need we didn't need it. Uh, we just recirculated water outside and right back in, and that was that was plenty of cooling. Um, so inside that tent there, we have all our equipment. It's being kept warm. Um, and see, the, the biggest challenges uh, at this site was was getting water in and out. It, um, we were on an island. It was isolated. There, the only uh, utility that was nearby was was electrical power. Um, so we were trucking in water and we were holding our wastewater in a in a waste tank that was then analyzed uh, to verify that it was um, below the acceptable limits of PFAS. We were all non-detect in those samples, which was wonderful. Uh, and then we were trucking that water out for disposal uh, on the base. So those were the those were the main operational challenges. Uh, our biggest setback was a was a power outage early on uh, that that did uh, do a little a little damage. Um, we were uh, ramping up, we were at full power, we were cruising, and um, a rapid, rapid cooling of the heaters can, can cause some contraction and, and some damage there. So we did um, lose a, about a week of, of heating time while we made those repairs. And then once we got those back up and running, uh, we were off to the races. So um, I want to say it took us about 90 days. We got to, these are, uh, this is a snapshot of December 13th. This was our, our ending period. Um, the average was about 415 degrees Celsius. You can see uh, the vertical profile in some of these places. You know, we have peak temperatures of uh, about 467. Um, but uh, I like uh, also a, a fun talking note that I like about this slide is this also happened to be one of the coldest days on site uh, in Fairbanks, which was uh, about negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit uh, while we reached our peak temperatures in the pile. So this, so just as an example, this uh, profile G6, the bottom part of the, of the pile was over 400 degrees Celsius, but the top didn't quite get that hot. Um, why, why do you think that is? We did, that, that corner of the pile did, uh, did appear to have a little bit of cooling, a little bit of heat losses um, yeah. going out the top there. So, so there was a portion of the, of the top corner uh, that didn't quite get as hot as the rest of the pile. So if we, so when we take when we took soil samples at the end, if we expected some of the soil not to be, you know, perfectly treated, it probably would be the top layer, I guess. That's right. And that was something Patrick um, and and the rest of the team, you know, we were all working through dialing in how much vacuum we wanted to apply to the pile, so that the pile uh, temperatures were very sensitive to that vacuum. So and that's mm -hmm. something that. Um, we we definitely have as a lessons learned, you know, that that upper portion was if we um, reduced vacuum, we saw a pretty quick um, increase in temperature at those shallowest steps. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely something Patrick and the rest of the team were we were dialing in for sure. So air, airflow makes a difference for sure here. Yeah. And I think I saw a question, you know, asked if there were air entry points in the pile. Um, we actually installed our, our valve system at the top where we could either extract air or we could also inject air. Um, given the cold temperatures surrounding the pile um, what, later on in operations, we ultimately ended up not, not wanting to inject that cold air into the pile, um, but we did initially have that um, installed, you know, so that if we wanted the option to try to recirculate air, we could put in the pile. So air coming in would be either from the bottom where the liner the pile was placed on was punctured, punctured somehow either by our heaters or by already just being punctured or from little openings in 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 our cover or where we have penetrations right there's always a little bit of leakage yeah and when it's under vacuum the, that leakage is is inward patrick you mentioned the power outage and uh, can we hear a little bit more about that what that did yeah, uh, yeah. I think if you uh, go to the next slide, there, there's a nice graph here. So you can see uh, we we kicked off on September 13th there, and our our temperatures were gradually increasing. That flat line that you see at 100 degrees C is is very normal. That's when we're boiling off the water, the pile. So we need before we can reach temperatures above the boiling temperature of water, we need to get rid of it. Um, so that's pretty typical in these in these settings. Um, but as you can see, that that blank week there um was uh, was when the power was lost so we uh made those repairs and then um and then went 
right back to full power and you can see those those uh temperatures were rapidly increasing after we we got back <clears throat> all right did, that did ultimately uh encourage us to uh, mobilize a backup generator so if that were to happen again we were ready uh especially while operating in the winter time we didn't want to take that risk it's interesting to see if you kind of take out this middle section and scoot the right section over the slopes go right back to where they were before when the power is back on right but we did lose what was that 10 15 days or so of progress yeah yeah which we would lo have loved to have back <laughs> later on but yeah and what's funny is after that power outage uh, patrick and the team ended up mobilizing a generator and then of course you know in case there was another one and then of course as soon as you do that we ended up not having another power outage yeah. 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 project so a lesson learned you know when you're doing high temperature thermal conduction heating and your, your heaters are getting super, super hot, you know, six, 700 Celsius, it really is best if the power stays on so they don't cool off and cool and heat up all the time. Uh, they have to be very robust in order to, to take that. And even if the heaters are robust enough, sometimes the casing by those temperature changes get, can get damaged from, and there'll be some potentially some flaking and other things that we, we really don't want. We want that, that dust. <laughs> That's a really good point, Gorm. I think that was actually the majority of the issues that we saw um, was that the heater, the heater element itself was still in good shape, but it was uh, the interior of the casing that was causing us problems. Yeah, and that this is hard to avoid when you're when you're heating metal up to these high temperatures, right? And there's it's just a physical thing. There's something called sensitization. Emily, you taught me uh, that the 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 steel loses. I think it's some of the nickel or chromium that gets loot gets lost and then it gets more brittle so just just the thing keep the power stable um and if possible uh minimize the times that the power is turned off because then the heaters won't have much time to cool off and you won't have these issues so, so with all that emily how how close do you think how we, we you and I sat down and had to model this and try to figure out how long it will take and to boil off the water and, and all that. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that and how, how it went in terms of, of power and energy, please? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think on the, yeah, perfect. So, so this is showing on the left-hand side, um, this is the energy balance that we initially modeled before the IELTSEN demonstration. So on the, um, on in the red curve that's showing that the temperature of the pile and you can see um, that flat line as there's you know there, you're boiling off all of the water as Patrick and Gorm were going through on the actual temperature rise so we saw that line up pretty nicely where we saw early on boiling off the water and then increasing to our, our target temperature um, and then in, in blue that's showing the injected energy so for this pile um, it was 134 cubic yards and this was the overall energy in, in blue is what you're seeing and then the losses um, is in that gray line just below it. And what you can see is there's, it's actually um, very close to that blue line. And, and the reason you're seeing such a high amount of losses is the geometry of that pile. So it's, it's a very small volume, it has a really high surface area. So you're going to have significant losses. And, um, and what, what you'll see on the right-hand side, that's, those are the actuals. So um, the, the blue curve and the gray, and then also the, the red temperature curve. So, so our, our energy input, our losses, and our temperature actuals actually lined up very nicely with the prediction, with the predicted values. And um, we just finished a design for a, a much larger pile. Um, as, as Patrick mentioned, um, you know, we didn't um, have the ability to manipulate this pile. So we, they wanted us to treat it in place. Um, so, you know, we are we opted to extend the heaters below the pile to help us overcome those heat losses. But if you don't ha have to do that and you have control over the geometry, um, we were able to complete a design for one where we were able to insulate the entire pile um, and it cut the overall energy losses in half. So um, essentially what, what we know based on what we observed at IELSEN and, and our modeling, we need about 250 to 300 kilowatt hours per cubic yard. That would be the net heating to get to the temperatures that we need to for PFAS treatment. And then the, the extra energy that you need on top of it, that would be for all of the losses. And that would be you know as a result of the geometry of the pile. And so everything that, a lot of the things that are going into our design right now are, are trying to minimize those heat losses it makes it less expensive and it, um, and it also makes it more sustainable, energy efficient. Very good. Um, 
We have a question from Catherine. Um, basically, she asked us, what, what temperature do we need to get effective removal of PFAS in soil? I guess we can, we can cover that real quick. Yeah, definitely. So we are initially at IELTS and we were targeting it at a temperature of 350 degrees Celsius. And as Patrick and Gore were sharing, I mean, you could see the temperature profile by depth in that pile. Um, what we ended up finding is that um, at the, the locations and depth intervals of the pile that were um, you know, above 400 degrees Celsius, um, they were all below detection limits. Um, but when we, those shallowest intervals where we um, were just at 350, uh, you know, some of those were were not not necessarily at the were not all at the detection limit. So that's something that um, mm -hmm. now, if with uh, later demonstrations, we really um, want to try to target 400 if we can. Again, we don't want to go too high. We're not trying to intentionally destroy or degrade, uh, you know, destruct these compounds. We're trying to volatilize them, but we want to make sure we get to a high enough temperature um, where we are able to successfully remove them from the soil. Very good. It's about 400 for about seven to 10 days, right? Then we're pretty comfortable that we, we're going to get close to non-detect. We've done that in the laboratory as, as well. Yeah, excellent. So speaking of soil concentrations, there's a question um, of, of how we did in terms of reducing PFAS concentration. So, so here, here is the, uh, the graph for that, if you don't mind. Yeah, and, and just to give a quick um, overview, so, so our two um, target compounds here were PFOS and PFOA. Um, we did a uh, sample for, uh, you know, the range of uh, target analysis at, at ILSIM. We were doing the 537.1, but now um, with this shift um, for our bill, we're doing, or for, um, you know, our, our, our demonstration that we're doing right now, we're doing 1633, but, you know, all the targeted compounds in that analysis, um, the, the two we were um, most interested in for ILSIM um, our PFOS and PFOA. So PFOA, um, after thermal treatment, we were below detection limits um, at all locations. PFOS, there was a, a you can see here in this graph on um, the highest concentrations um, before treatment, which are shown in red, um, were uh, just under 250 micrograms per kilogram. This was one of the most concentrated piles uh, at IELTS and Air Force Base. And you can see um, in blue post-thermal treatment, um, we were uh, below detection limits almost, at almost all the locations. The locations where we were not were at those shallowest intervals where we um, were just at um, just under, you know, the 350 degrees Celsius. And so, um, you know, we, that's kind of a, a lessons learned for us is that we, we know we want to target just a bit higher than 350. So our, our target is, is more than 400 degrees Celsius range for PFAS sites. Fantastic. Yeah, and I know, um, I know you shipped one of these samples to Kurt Pinnell at Brown University, yeah. right? And he then heated it for an additional week and then showed that it got to non-detect. So yeah, so we, we did what we could to, to establish, you know, basically full scale, exactly what operating parameters we needed. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things we, we put in the title of this webinar to, to uh, interest people is sustainability and Patrick, all this equipment you you had shipped up there and operated, you know, how much of it is actually reusable? Uh, most of it, really. Uh, our TRS equipment is um, is uh, completely reusable and customizable to to different sites and different needs. I've heard one of our engineers call us a traveling circus of environmental remediation. Um, so the the uh, the the equipment is all completely reusable. Uh, I've been with TRS about eight years, and I think. Um, most of it outdates me, um, and it's also uh, extremely adaptable. As I as I mentioned, um, all the components are are mixable, and matchable to to really custom fit uh, the site uh, and the design needs. Um, we're currently the uh, if you go to the next there we go. Um, so this this equipment is uh, is the Ielson equipment fresh off the boat, uh, shipped down to California and another uh, another Air Force installation there. Um, and so it is uh, currently in use, operating uh, at almost a identical system, uh, similar. This one is an in situ demonstration. Uh, so we're treating the, the soil directly below the crane there. Um, and uh, yeah, it's all it's all completely reusable. The, the tanks that you saw previously, they were rinsed out, washed out, uh, verified clean and, uh, and, uh, and reused. And um, all of our equipment is, is in use again at a new site. Fantastic. So, so 
I know the heater casings that were in the soil pile itself probably corroded some on the inside, right? Those are some of the only things that, that we can't use again. We, we, we take the heater, electrical connection boxes, right? The cables, all of that gets, gets uh, sent back and, and used over and over again. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So that, that's one of the things people, you know, look at a thermal site and they go, oh my God, look at all that hardware that cannot be sustainable, but they forget that it's not a one-time use. It, it, uh, it, it is used many, many times. Um, of course, the electricity we won't get back and we use to heat the soil, right? But, but that is one thing you, you can readily do. Um, I'll maybe jump a little bit, Emily, and ask you, um, TRS had options for different types of thermal conduction heating technologies. How come you chose to go the, the route of electrical heaters? Yeah, you, you can use, so we went with electrically powered um, or electrical TCH, but there is um, gas powered TCH as well. Um, you know, one of the main reasons we went with that is uh, in, which kind of twofold, actually. Um, one would be, uh, you know, the, the amount of control and precision we have over electric electricity delivery. So with our heaters, we can tailor them and design them so that um, the resistance of the heaters, um, we can direct power um, to different depth intervals um, at, we can deliver higher levels of power at different depth intervals. Um, we can also, um, you know, very tailor and exact power delivery. We know exactly what we're going to be delivering based on that resistance. So we have a lot of control over that and how many heaters we add to the pile. Um, our predictions can match very closely um, to our actuals when we use um, electricity and we can tailor our heater design around that for each pile. Um, with gas, you have less control. Um, and then there's also a lot of energy that um, that is released to exhaust. So you're, you're not using that energy, whereas with uh, electrically powered um, heaters, all of the energy we're delivering to those heaters is used in the subsurface. So it's, it's much more sustainable. Okay. And, and the electricity can be produced by hydro power, hydroelectric power plants, solar, uh, not on site, right? We need too much yeah. for, for our own solar panels, but, or wind power. You know, I was involved in a, in a site in Denmark, actually, where the power was all coming from a hydroelectric plant. And we could say all the energy used for this thermal remediation was, was green energy. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that's something that affects our, our, um, our sustainability. Um, I know that the heat used for this particular demonstration of only 134 cubic yards of soil was, was quite a lot of energy, right? Can you talk to us about how will we, how, how do we scale this up and how do we, how do we improve on basically unit, unit energy use or as we call it, energy density? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so as we discussed a little bit earlier, you know, when, when we were, when we had a specific uh, geometry that we needed to tailor um, th thermal treatment to, um, that resulted in a, a really high amount of heat losses. Um, so what we've done is we've been working to scale up this technology. Um, we have um, now, uh, these are just an example of a few of the scenarios of different, uh, you know, preferred geometries for different treatment volumes. And what we're doing here is we're trying to minimize the overall heat losses that would be um, released uh, from, the, from the surface area. We're also looking to be most efficient with heater materials. So you saw in the layout that Patrick was describing with the temperatures, there were a lot of heaters in that pile. They were vertical. Um, and that was because of the, the small volume um, and, and the geometry of it. But if you have control over the geometry, uh, we can design, you know, these are all showing you would do ideally horizontal heaters here. Um, and we, and the layout of these heaters is also to minimize the amount of material, heater materials that are used. So we're, we're trying to be more efficient with energy, um, more efficient with uh, the amount of material that is used. So there's much fewer heaters, um, you know, per cubic yard uh, overall for the, for the project, um, you know, as you're able to scale this up and really have control over that, over that geometry. Um, you know, and, and, and in addition, and, you know, trying to keep a, you know, a, a focus on sustainability, um, when you are creating an ex situ cell, if you had a larger volume, um, you could also transport soil um, in and out of a single cell. And so you could reuse the cell um, the, and, and we can even, the supports that are used around the cell, we can reuse from site to site. So we can deliver them um, and, you know, from, from one site to another. So a lot of these materials can be reused as well 
you know, again, just keeping that sustainability focus. Fantastic. How low can you go, you think, in terms of kilowatt hours for, for a cubic yard treated? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, we need a net a minimum of um, 250 to um, 300 kilowatt hours per cubic yard. That would be the net heating for PFAS. And then just, you know, you're trying to minimize the, um, you know, the heat losses as much as possible. At Ielsen, our insulative cover that Patrick showed, we had a minimum R value of 30. So if you were able to have a really nice insulation over the entire pile, you could significantly reduce your heat losses that way. Very good. Um, there is a question from Diana. She's asking how long did it take to mobilize, you know, in and out, mob times in and out for this, for this type of project. That's probably one for you, Patrick. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a matter of months. Um, Alaska was, was challenging, obviously, because of the distances that we had to cover and the logistics of, uh, of getting things to and from there. Um, you know, with start to finish from, from, uh, from a contract signature mobilization, a, a few months for design um, and getting equipment on the ground, uh, another couple months to build. Uh, and then demobilization is typically a lot faster, uh, usually around two months. Cool. Um, another quick question, uh, is the treatment time and cost a function of the starting concentration for PFAS? Yeah, I, you know, in terms of the, the starting concentration, because we're, able, you know, we have, we didn't present it in this um, today, but we uh, performed lab testing um, a few years ago, published the data and the starting concentrations were over 20,000 uh, micrograms per kilogram. So heavily concentrated um, for PFAS. Um, and we were able to, with a very similar temp temperature and treatment time, um, get below detection limits. So at 400 degrees Celsius, we were at below detection limits for all the PFAS um, that were targeted PFAS that were detected. So our, our treatment time wouldn't really change significantly. I think it's more the, um, the amount of volume that you have. And if you had maybe needed to split it into multiple batches, that might affect your treatment time. So, but you know what, what Gorm is showing here on, on his screen, you know, the, the 10 to 15,000 cubic yard, that's still really in a, in a sweet spot for us to be able to do a, a, a single treatment. Um, so we could always do, um, sequential treatments of those sizes if we needed to. Yeah, I agree, totally agree with that answer. I mean, I think starting water content has a bigger impact on the cost of treatment than starting PFAS concentration. Yep. And that's because you just need to spend energy boiling all that water off. Whereas the PFAS, even in a pile, this pile was only 134 cubic yards, but we're talking grams of PFAS or milligrams of PFAS, right? So the yeah. mass of PFAS that you, you actually release from the soil that makes it into the carbon, for instance, is still a very, very small amount. So it's not like even if you have 10 times higher to begin with that you're gonna use a lot more carbon. It's really not because the carbon has is size based on flow rates and effective flow of air through, not so much how much PFAS is coming. There's plenty of adsorption capacity. So. All our things are, all our heaters and everything else operate exactly the same way, no matter what your starting concentration is. And even target temperatures will be the same, right? We're going to a temperature that's high enough that we know we can get to the very low numbers. And in the process of going there, we're vaporizing at higher concentrations as well. As well. And Greg, you brought up a good point with the, the amount of moisture in the pile. So when we gave that range of 250 to, to 300 kilowatt hours per cubic yard, that the reason there's a range there is really due to the, you know, it's the amount of moisture that's present in the soil is going to vary from site to site. So that'll be really that, that biggest driver why it would vary. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I see more questions. It's, <laughs> it's very good. Is there a way to determine potential heat loss in a fractured bedrock environment for in-situ treatment? <laughs> and would, would stable temperatures be attainable? Um, that's a tough one. I would, if I may, I can I can start on that one. I number one, I you know, this this is about PFAS treatment. Um, when we're we wouldn't be treating PFAS in a bedrock setting with with the water field fractures. I don't think that's that's really a sweet spot for this type of application. Um, however, is um, that's a whole different story, right? But had, had we been talking about TCE, DNAPL, 
that goes into a fracture in bedrock. That's a different story. We, we can we can ad address those types of, of sites. Um, but for PFAS, if that's what the question was intending in bed, fracture of bedrock, um, it would have to be above the water table for us to be able to attain temperatures in the range of 400. If it's above the water table, it's not any more difficult than treating sand. Uh, and we can do it with this technology. I just don't, haven't seen a lot of, of applications like that, right? Where the, there's PFAS in shallow bedrock. So that would be how I would try to answer it. Um, what was the primary source of contamination? And this refers to IELTS in the Air Force Base. Uh, I can take that one. I believe it was um, fire, fire training, um, the use of the fluorinated uh, firefighting foams. Yeah. That you have to do that at active air force bases, right? And you have these these typically round areas where you're doing the 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 training and the spraying, and then everywhere around that you have soil shallow soil PFAS contamination, and that's what they've dug up and put in piles. Um, a lot of times they also have a, a groundwater plume, but that's a whole a whole different story than this. Um, Let's see. Feel free to pick up any of the questions, you two, if if you do, if you do, uh, if you want to. Uh, Carolyn, hi, Carolyn. Um, long time no see. Can this be combined with ERH or TCH for CVOCs? And I would say absolutely yes. You know, it's similar to what uh, has been done in the past at other sites. With let's say it's a TCE site that also had transformer leaks. So sites would have PCBs in the shallow soils that could be treated at these type of temperatures. And then TCE down below that can be treated with electrical resistance heating, which is wet, it only has to get to 100 degrees C. So the deeper TCE VOC contamination is cost very cost effectively treated with electrical resistance heating, uh, whereas the, the uh, PFAS up here would need to go to a much higher temperature and would be treated with thermal conduction heating. And yes, you can absolutely do that at the same time, at the same site, if that's a requirement. I would add, I would add Gorm, if there was, if it was co-mingling uh, CVOCs with the PFAS, we would treat the CVOCs just on the way, uh, on our way to the final destination and the treatment system would be more or less the same. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In this case, any VOCs in the pile would have been vaporized during that heating and drying phase where you where you showed Patrick the temperature uh, plateauing at 200 or at 100 degrees right that's then the all the VOCs would be gone by then and then the water dries out and then you go to the higher temperature yeah. there was a question about if TRS has experience for in-situ applications for PFAS treatment so we're actually doing a demonstration at um, Beale Air Force Base right now um, and it is an in-situ demonstration so we're um, we're actively treating right now and um, yeah, we've got, we've got a few weeks left of the demonstration, but um, you know, going well, I, I think our, our highest temperature is, is well over 200 degrees Celsius at the, in the treatment volume. But again, that, that is where the water table is much lower. So we're, we're heating to 18 feet below grade um, and the water table's at 55. So definitely it's a beta zone application. Fantastic. And then the, the, the usual question, how much is this going to cost? When we when I'm, I'm rephrasing the question a little bit because pilot tests you just do not do dollars divided by volume for pilot tests and everybody would go you know that's even writing the work plan divided that cost with the cubic yards you get a, a, a crazy number so when we're scaling this up I know Emily you did a you did a fifteen thousand cubic yard uh, scale up scenario for our ESTCP final report and if you don't mind just sharing roughly what we're aiming at for treatment cost. Yeah, so so in terms of that, that scale up scenario, as Cor mentioned it, so that larger pile, 15,000 cubic yards, there's definitely an economy with scale. And the range for that, it, it depends on location. There are a number of considerations, but we, um, for the, the step scale up scenario, um, it was between 480 to 610 per cubic yard. And then you need to add the electricity on top of that. And that can vary quite widely. Um, it can be anywhere from 31 to $170 um, per cubic yard. So it really depends on the location. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, if, if you have a specific location in mind, we can definitely model it and give you a feel for, for where that would come in at. 
Really good. And um, Carolyn had one more question. It was, can you do this under buildings? And I think that one's pretty easy to answer, right? Because because of the target temperature we need for PFAS, um, luckily most of the time PFAS doesn't get spilled right under, underneath buildings. So it's not a very a typical scenario with high concentrations of PFAS in the soils right underneath a building. But, but if it was, we would not typically use, uh, we would typically not try to heat if the building was in use and uh, to 400 degrees C, it would simply be too much of a problem to have be that hot right underneath the foundation of a building. You would see significant um, subsidence typically and and, and the, the building foundation would get damaged at those high temperatures. We can do it uh, at lower temperatures. We can treat TCE and other things like that at, at around 80 to 100 Celsius where we're not desiccating the soil and we're not creating cracks and, and foundation damages. But for if, if the question, Carolyn, was meant for PFAS right under buildings, we don't have a, a fix for that at the moment. They would simply, it requires too much, too hot of a, high of a temperature for the buildings to survive, I would say. Oh yeah, we, we very commonly treat under buildings for at lower temperature ranges where we're looking to target steaming conditions for CVOCs, for instance. Um, that's common for us, but yeah, I, I agree completely for them. Yeah. yeah. Those higher temperatures. And we'll, and we'll take one more, one more sample or one more question. We're almost out of time. OTM45, um, you mentioned that, Emily, and there's a question from Philip, you know, what, was there any trouble using that method and how did that go? Yeah, so um, we we have been very lucky at, at both Ielsen and Beale Air Force Base, we've had good partners. So at um, at Ielsen, we had Alaska Source testing and they had a lot of experience, OTM45 sampling, um, and then also worked with Eurofin. So they were our team out there and they um, they did such a great job during, you know, throughout the project. And now um, at Beale Air Force Base, um, Eurofins is also doing the analysis. We're also doing some sequential extraction and, and Eurofins actually sent one of their um, field, um, uh, you know, one of their field uh, technicians to come out and help ensure that the, the sampling went off without a hitch. Um, Clean Air has been helping with that. So we've had good um, good folks helping us so that we haven't really run into issues. We've been able to successfully complete those sampling events, but they've had quite a bit of experience leading up to those sampling events to help us. Thank you so much. Oh, there's one more question. <clears throat> so this is only suitable for soil impacted, right? With PFAS, not, doesn't sound like it's good for groundwater. And Catherine, absolutely right. You know, this is thermal desorption, you know, with thermal conduction heating, and it, it is for soil treatment of PFAS. It can be soils or sediments or excavated material or fines from soil washing, but it is not to, it's not a process for below the water table. Uh, the water below the water table, PFAS is relatively mobile already, and there's too much water around for us to be able to reach the temperatures we need. It, it's really hotspot source uh, zone treatment, not, not the plume. There are a number of other questions. So I think, um, you have, as Gore mentioned, we're, we'll develop responses to those. We, we definitely want to make sure they're all answered, and we can share those after. Yeah, are any of them particularly that you, that- uh... I was thinking about maybe the collection of soil samples to show that the soil will yep. ferment. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Did. yeah I think that... yeah, Patrick, do you want to do it? Sure, yeah, so that one was was challenging. As Gorm mentioned, uh, the soils were quite desiccated at the end of the project. Um, so the, the the shallow ones were easily collected with a hand auger. Uh, we had to follow all, all kinds of uh, uh, PFAS soil sampling SOP procedures to make sure we didn't contaminate the samples. Um, we were also protecting ourselves from the cold and the heat at the same time. Um, so that was uh, that was exciting. But ultimately, to get the deeper ones, we used um, uh, the geoprobe once again to advance uh, a barrel down into the deeper intervals and then hand order to collect the sample. So hand order is a short answer. And then essentially for showing before and after if we've met the goals, we, we collected uh, soil samples at baseline and after heating at every temperature sensor location so we could correlate temperatures to uh, sample soil concentrations. And then we took, uh, we looked at both an average of those discrete samples, but then we also ran a composite of those. So Brown University, Kurt Pinnell's lab did all, a ton of analytical for this project. So they 
they did um, the, that composite sample as well. And the average of those discrete samples and the composite both lined up really nicely before and after treatment. Fantastic. And uh, Louise had a question, how volatile are the PFAS compared to VOCs? And that's of course is a, is a very, um, I'll, I'll try that one. Basically PFAS, is, there's more than 5,000 compounds, right? The, the bigger ones like PFAS, are, have boiling points in the 300 C range. I don't remember the exact, but they're as difficult to vaporize as dioxins and furans and PCBs. So, and then the, the smaller um, smaller PFAS compounds can be as VOCs. So our lesson there is simply to get everything, we gotta get up to the temperatures high enough to get semi-volatiles out of the ground, but we have to be ready from day one when we turn the SV system on, there's gonna be something coming at us even much, much at much, much, much lower uh, temperatures. The, the short chains are starting to come out at steam temperatures and so on. So when you're treating PFAS, you have to be very careful that you're ready for it and you have to be ready for both volatile short chains and intermediate volatility, middle length change, and then the less volatile uh, long chains. And then on top of that, you have reactions occurring. You know, PFAS turns into, breaks down into other um, basically PFAS compounds. So it's very interesting at this site, right, Emily? This, this was a PFOS site as we knew it based on soil data. But when you looked at the vapor data, if you only had the vapor data, exactly what we sucked out of the pile, you wouldn't think it was a PFAS dominated. Uh, site, right? We had other PFAS compounds in higher concentrations than the PFOS, which was the, the starting highest concentration. Yeah. So it's not, don't want to end on a negative here, but we, it's just so important that we're ready to treat it. And the system we apply, you apply, is robust enough to be ready for both short and long chains and reaction byproducts. Another reason for why we are at the moment choosing to cool everything off, separate liquid from vapor and use best available technology at ambient temperature to purify both the liquid and the vapor. It's the safest option for us at, at least. Okay, um, any unanswered questions? We will follow up in writing. Thank you so much, Patrick and Emily for, for being here today. And thank you everyone who dialed in. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone.